everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Natalie Hemming. She was a beautiful beautiful young woman who just suddenly disappeared one day in the spring of 2016. When Natalie was reported as missing, it was only a matter of hours before someone was arrested in connection to her case. Pretty much immediately, the police and her family were confident that they knew exactly who was responsible for her disappearance and murder. So for this week's case, as I said, we are going back to the year 2016 in Milton Keynes, which is an area located in Buckinghamshire in England. And this is Natalie Hemming. She was 31 years old when this case happened. She was born in 1985. Natalie's mother was named Margaret, and unfortunately I couldn't find the name of her father anywhere. I'm unsure if he was really in the picture or not when Natalie was growing up. But her mother was Margaret, and Natalie was one of five children. Children. She had two sisters and two brothers and their names were Kerry and Joanne and Stephen and Sean. And Natalie was the youngest so she was always really like the baby of the family. And because she was the youngest her siblings said that that meant that she often got away with a lot. I feel like that is always the case with younger siblings. I'm also one of five actually and I can definitely say that my youngest brother got away with the most growing up. So Natalie was quite cheeky. She would bicker and argue with her siblings sometimes times as all siblings do but as she grew older she remained very close to them. Her mother Margaret said that Natalie was always a bit of a bookworm, she loved to read at school, her favourite subjects were history and English but she also really really liked to dance. Natalie's sister Joanne described Natalie as being quite bossy at times, she was very outspoken and loud. Joanne said that they were actually quite alike in that sense, they both had that kind of big out there personality but equally Natalie was also very kind and caring. She was one of those people that would have done anything for anyone, always willing to help others. Around 2007 time, Natalie met a man that she would go on to have kids with. By this point, actually, Natalie already had a child. She had a daughter from a previous marriage. Unfortunately, this marriage just didn't work out, and so she got a divorce. And in 2007, she met a man named Paul Hemming. They met in a supermarket and they began seeing each other. Natalie's sister Kerry said that Natalie and Paul seemed to move very quickly. Their relationship progressed very quickly. It wasn't long before they moved in together. Natalie moved in with Paul and he basically became the stepfather to her daughter. So things seemed to be going really well. Natalie seemed to be happy with Paul. However, in all honesty, her family never really got very good vibes from him. Even when they met him for the very first time, her sister Joanne said that he just seemed very standoffish. He wasn't really that friendly. He was quite cold, I guess, which they just thought was quite odd. But, you know, as I said, Natalie seemed to be happy, so her family were happy for her. She seemed settled and comfortable. I think Paul was doing quite well for himself. I don't think he was rich by any means, but he was financially stable. He had a good job, so he had a nice house and a nice car, etc. So anyway, their relationship continued, and eventually Natalie and Paul had two children together. They had a son and a daughter who were about three years apart. So at the time that this case took place in 2016, their son was six years old and their daughter was just three years old. And Natalie's daughter from her previous marriage was 12. But despite having these children and starting a family together, their relationship was very bumpy, very turbulent. Again, Natalie's family just always 
had a bit of a bad taste in their mouths about Paul Hemming. Just the way that he was, the way that he acted, and some of the things that he did were just very strange. So for example, he and Natalie weren't actually married, I don't believe. She had taken his last name, obviously she was called Natalie Hemming, but they weren't married, although they were engaged. They were due to be getting married. And they even had stuff booked for their wedding. However, for some reason, just completely out of the blue, Paul just cancelled everything. He cancelled their wedding and he didn't even tell Natalie. Also, when his two children were christened, he didn't turn up to the christening. Again, I don't know why, but yeah, he was just a no-show. Paul was a very controlling man. It was like everything had to be on his terms. He wanted to control every single aspect of his relationship with Natalie. He was very mentally and emotionally abusive, actually. Like, like I said, he and Natalie were engaged and Paul kept promising Natalie that they would get married but then he just wouldn't. When the big day was approaching, he cancelled it. But the abuse didn't end there. Paul Hemming was also physically abusive towards his partner and this started just months into their relationship. In 2007, so the same year that they got together, Paul and Natalie had an argument and he turned violent. He grabbed her mobile phone when she received a text message from someone and he literally threw it straight at Natalie and it hit her in the head and it really hurt. It hit her hard. So Natalie was in a lot of pain. She was bleeding and so she asked Paul to take her to the hospital or to call an ambulance but he said no he refused instead he just carried on with the violence he apparently threw Natalie onto the bed and he put his hand around her neck eventually Paul let go and he agreed to take Natalie to the hospital so that doctors could treat her head wound however during the car journey he threatened Natalie and he said that she wasn't allowed to tell the doctors the truth about what happened that he was the one who did this to her and I believe she did what he said she didn't tell them but eventually after a while she found the courage to get in contact with the police and report the incident however less than a month later she took back this police report she revoked her statement at the time she claimed that Paul hadn't made her do this she was doing it of her own free will but I mean it's probably very likely that she was lying about that she was getting pressure from him to drop the case but also it's believed that she dropped it because because despite what he had done, she still loved Paul and she didn't want to give up on the relationship. She wanted to make it work with him. And so the relationship continued and of course, so did the abuse. Paul was still violent and abusive, but Natalie became very, very good at masking it and hiding it. She kept very, very tight-lipped about what was going on. She wouldn't really speak to her family about it. Her family knew that some thing was going on. They knew that things weren't quite right between Paul and Natalie, but I don't think they ever really knew the extent of what was happening. Natalie would always downplay it, and so Paul was able to get away with it for so long without anyone knowing. He remained very, very controlling. He controlled what Natalie did. He would always check her phone, check her text messages. He was incredibly controlling when it came to the finances. He decided what they spent their money on. Natalie never got a say. He was still violent. During one of his violent outbursts, he threw a glass bottle at Natalie. And I believe the police became involved again after this incident and Natalie and her children went to stay with her mother Margaret for a little while. And in 2013, Natalie packed her things and she took her children to Yorkshire where her sister Joanne lived. She went to go and stay with her sister to get away from Paul's abuse. And she did start to confide in Joanne. She told her a little bit about what Paul was really like. However, Paul just followed her to Yorkshire. He wouldn't just let her be. He turned up at the door and he pretty much begged her to get back with him. He made her all of the false promises that he had made before that he would change. He wouldn't treat her this way again. He said that they could get married, etc, etc. And just like Natalie had done before, she believed Paul. He had successfully manipulated her and she eventually agreed to give 
the relationship another go she went back to Milton Keynes with him where they lived her sister Joanne tried to stop her she pretty much warned her that it was going to happen again that Paul wouldn't change but Natalie didn't listen and off she went once again she gave Paul a chance however the final straw came for Natalie in 2016 by this point she had suffered years and years of abuse from her partner years of being controlled years of violence and she finally had enough she had made the decision that this was it now she was going to leave Paul and this time it was going to be for good and so she told her family of her plan she told them that her and Paul were over she even said that it was quite an amicable decision that they had made together both she and Paul agreed that the relationship wasn't working and that they needed to separate and they even made plans to rent out their house in Milton Keynes and they decided that Paul was going to find his own flat and Natalie was going to find another house for her and the three children and Natalie's family said that when she finally made this decision to leave Paul for good they saw such a huge change in her and her character it was almost like they had the old Natalie back the abuse that she had suffered had made her into a completely different person but now that she was making plans to get away from that get away from her abuser she was so so much more positive she was smiling so much more she was excited now about the future however sadly that excitement was short-lived because in the spring of 2016 31 year old Natalie Hemming just suddenly disappeared on the 30th of April 2016 Natalie dropped her three children off at her mother Margaret's house they were going to stay at their grandma's that evening because Natalie had made plans to actually go out on a date she had recently started seeing this guy from her work his name was Simon and they worked together at a local car dealership I think they'd been friends for a while Simon was always really really nice to her he used to bring her a drink when she was working and stuff and as I said more recently after she and Paul had separated Natalie started seeing Simon and she really liked him and they made plans to go out on the 30th of April so Natalie dropped her kids off at Margaret's house and then from there Simon picked her up and they went out I believe they went to like a restaurant or a bar together or something and then Natalie stayed with Simon that night now unfortunately the youngest of the three children Natalie's youngest daughter who was just three she was really really struggling to to sleep and settle that night at Margaret's house and so Margaret got in contact with Paul who came to pick his daughter up so that she could go back with him and hopefully settle down with her dad and Margaret said that when Paul arrived he immediately noticed that Natalie's car was parked outside of Margaret's house now from what I can gather Natalie didn't really tell anyone who she was going out with that night she told her family and Paul that she was just going out with friends because you know when you've just started seeing someone you don't always want people around you to know about it straight away so when Paul arrived at Margaret's house and he saw Natalie's car he said to Margaret why is Natalie's car here and Margaret just said well I guess she was picked up by friends because she's going out for a drink she wouldn't have wanted to drive the following day so the 1st of May 2016 Natalie was dropped back to her mum's house and she collected her kids and they left her mum's house at around 1.30 that afternoon. When they left, they went back to their home in Newton Lees in Milton Keynes. Now, just to clarify, even though Paul and Natalie had separated by this point, they were still living together with their children. They were just living together whilst they kind of sorted everything out. So whilst Paul was looking for a flat to rent and Natalie was looking for another house to move into with the kids. Obviously, these things do take time so anyway on the afternoon of the 1st of May Natalie returned to the house with her kids and then later that day that evening Natalie's mother Margaret tried to ring her just to check in check that she got back okay however Natalie didn't answer the phone and she didn't ring her mum back and so Margaret tried to contact Natalie the next day but again there was no response and so she tried again the day after that but still no luck she just couldn't 
get through to her. Natalie was not picking up the phone. And Margaret just thought that this was so strange because this was so unlike Natalie. They spoke to each other, I think, every single day. So the fact that it had been a couple of days and she still hadn't heard anything from Natalie, it was so unusual. On the 3rd of May 2016, so this was two days after Margaret last saw and spoke to Natalie, Margaret contacted Natalie's sibling. She rang one of her older sisters, Joanne, and said, I can't get hold of Natalie. I don't know what's going on. And when Joanne learned that Margaret hadn't been able to get in touch with Natalie for days at this point, she too thought that it was so odd because, again, it just wasn't like Natalie to just ignore someone, ignore her mum for that long, especially because of the fact that Natalie was the kind of person that was always on her phone. Natalie's family were just really starting to worry. Something didn't seem right and so a couple of members of her family decided to just go to Natalie's house in Milton Keynes to see if she was there and if she was okay. When they arrived, Natalie's car was parked in the driveway and so was her ex-partner's car, Paul's car. So they knocked on the front door and after quite a while, Paul answered, but he seemed very reluctant to let Natalie's family into the house for some reason. But eventually one of Natalie's cousins just kind of pushed his way in and he looked around the house, but Natalie wasn't there. There was no sign of her. And so they said to Paul, where is she? Where's Natalie? And Paul basically said that Natalie had just left. She decided that she was just going to go away for a few days and that she'd be back. But to be honest, I don't think her family believed this at all. Firstly, if she's gone away for a few days, why is her car still parked in the driveway? Why hadn't she taken her car? Secondly, why hadn't she told her family that she was going away? Like I said a minute ago, she spoke to her mum, Margaret, pretty much every single day. So why hadn't she let her mum know? And also her family didn't believe it because they didn't believe that Natalie would have just left her kids with Paul for that long. She clearly wasn't even willing to leave them alone with him for one night when she went out with that guy from work, Simon. She wanted the kids to stay with her mum that night. It just did not add up at all. Nothing about Paul's story made sense and her family just had a really, really awful feeling about this. And so Natalie's mum actually decided to get in contact with the police and report her youngest child as missing. And Margaret even told the operator on this phone call that she believed Natalie's ex-partner, Paul Hemming, might have had something to do with this, something to do with her daughter's very, very sudden disappearance. So straight away, the police already had a suspect or a person of interest in the case, Paul Hemming. So they immediately went to the family home that same evening and they spoke to Paul. When they arrived, they asked Paul to just quickly show them around so that they could double check that Natalie definitely wasn't in the house and she wasn't, their search confirmed that. And so they just sat down with Paul and they started asking him some questions, like when he last saw Natalie, what their relationship was like, etc, etc. They also asked him if they could take his phone and just have a look through it, but he was very reluctant to give it to them. He basically said, oh, you can't have my phone because Natalie might call me on it. And so the police started to try and trace Natalie's phone. They wanted to see if there had been any activity on it. And it was discovered that she hadn't used it. Her phone hadn't been touched since around the time that she would have returned to the house on the 1st of May after she picked the children up from her mum's. And it was the same with her bank account. She hadn't used her bank Card. She hadn't taken any money out. And if she really had just gone away for a few days, it seems really strange that there wouldn't have been any activity on her bank. How was she paying for things like food and accommodation? All of this just made Paul Hemming appear incredibly suspicious. And also his behaviour just added to the suspicion as well. Like I said, he wasn't willing to let the police search his phone. He wasn't actually willing to let the police search the house either. Either. He eventually let them, but at first he was very reluctant to let them do so, he said, because the kids were asleep in bed and he didn't want them to be woken up. And also the way that he was answering questions was just so 
odd. He seemed to be very evasive. So the police actually very quickly made the decision to arrest Paul Hemming. And even though Natalie hadn't been found, he was arrested on suspicion of murder just the morning after Natalie was reported as missing. The police were confident that he had done something to Natalie and so he was taken to the police station for further questioning and interestingly the first thing he said as soon as he was arrested was quote have you found Natalie then? Following his arrest Natalie's children were picked up by members of her family they were going to stay with them and the search for Natalie began. Her family took to social media to try and spread awareness of her disappearance. Door-to-door -door inquiries were being carried out by the police. They were speaking to Paul and Natalie's neighbours to see if maybe they had any information, if they had seen or heard anything suspicious around the time that she went missing. And of course, meanwhile, as all of this was going on, Paul was being interviewed. Now, Paul ran the police through his version of events. He pretty much told them the exact same thing that he had told Natalie's family when they came looking for her. He said that on the afternoon of the 1st of May 2016, Natalie returned home from her mum's house with the kids. He said later that evening the kids all went to bed and then at around 9pm he went to bed too. And he said that Natalie left the house that night and said that she was going to go away for a few days. However, he elaborated on this. He gave the police more information about this situation than he originally gave her family. Paul said that there was a reason why Natalie wanted to just get away for a bit and that reason was that she had been raped. Paul claimed that when Natalie came home with the kids that afternoon, the afternoon of the first, he immediately noticed that something wasn't quite right with her. She wasn't her normal self and so he started asking her what was wrong and Natalie told him that the previous night she had gone out on a date with that guy from work Simon and then at the end of the night they went back to his place and she said that whilst they were there Simon kept pressuring her to have sex with him and he wouldn't stop she kept saying no but he carried on trying to persuade her until eventually she just gave in he raped her and then Paul said that after she told him this that's when Natalie just decided to just go away for a short while just to kind of clear her head and process what had happened to her and he was supportive of this he told her to go and he said that he would look after the kids and so she went and he went to sleep around 9 p.m that evening and he said that he didn't leave the house at all that night he was in all night however this story about the rape was soon contradicted because the police discovered that the morning after her date with Simon Natalie had been texting one of her friends friends about how amazing the date went, how she had such an incredible time with him and she said that they even slept together a couple of times and that that was amazing. The police also checked the CCTV footage from the place where Simon and Natalie went to that night and the pair were seen smiling, they were holding hands, they kissed. Natalie seemed so happy and yet Paul was claiming that Natalie said she had a horrible time and that Simon raped her but that's not what the evidence suggests. It appeared as though it he was trying to implicate someone else. He was trying to divert the police's attention to Simon because he knew that the police were so suspicious of him. But that wasn't the only part of Paul's story that didn't add up. If you recall, he also said that he went to bed at 9pm that evening and that he stayed in all night. He didn't go out. However, this was soon contradicted because the police discovered that Paul Hemming's car was actually caught on a couple of different automatic number plate recognition cameras that evening. I believe the first time he was spotted on a camera was around 10.15pm and his number plate was picked up a few more times in different spots over the next few hours. Now unfortunately because it was the middle of the night the cameras couldn't get an image of the person driving the vehicle but it was Paul's car and he said that he was home all night. If it was Paul 
people were in the car that night and the police believed that it was, then where was he going? What was he doing? The police had a really bad feeling that that was him possibly disposing of Natalie's body after he killed her. I mean, in the beginning of the investigation, the police had a few different theories as to what might have happened to Natalie. There was, of course, the possibility that she had genuinely just decided to go away on her own for a little while, although as time went on, that theory did seem harder and harder to believe. There was another theory that, again, she had gone away on her own, but that something bad had happened to her during this. Maybe she she was attacked or abducted by a stranger and then obviously there was the number one theory in the case and that was that Paul Hemming, her abusive and violent ex-partner, was responsible for her disappearance and that was the theory that the police and everyone believed the most. As the police kept digging, they just kept finding more and more evidence to indicate that that was what happened. The fact that he was reluctant to let the police search his phone and the house, the fact that he was evasive when answering questions, the fact that he said that he never left the house that night and yet his car did. It was out for hours just in the middle of the night. But the evidence didn't stop there because when the police spoke to Paul and Natalie's children, they received some very interesting information from their son, their six-year-old son. Obviously, all of the children were in the house on the night that Natalie went missing, the night that she supposedly decided to just leave and go away for a few days. They were upstairs in their bedrooms sleeping. So after Paul was arrested, the children were interviewed and their son actually said that he remembered hearing something that night. He remembered hearing a very, very loud bang. Obviously, he couldn't really say what time this happened because he was only six, but he said that it was so loud that it felt like thunder. And so he got out of his bed and he went downstairs to see what the noise was and when he went downstairs and he peeked into the living room he said that he saw his mummy he saw Natalie and she was wrapped up in a blanket now of course being only six years old he just thought that his mum was sleeping at the time but the police believe that Natalie might have actually been dead by that point when her son saw her and that that loud bang that he heard was Paul killing her. Maybe it was a violent struggle that he heard, maybe it was Natalie being hit by Paul. He also described having seen like a bowl or something on the floor, I think like a washing up bowl, and he said that his daddy was cleaning up. And he also said that a rug was missing from the living room. They had this big red rug on the living room floor, but when he went downstairs, it was gone. And his dad, Paul, later told him that he had taken it into his work to be clean. So this is all starting to paint a picture now, isn't it? That Natalie was attacked and probably killed in the living room and then afterwards Paul was trying to clean up the scene and get rid of any evidence. However, he clearly didn't do the best job at cleaning the scene because when a forensic team was sent into the home to look for evidence, they did actually find blood. They found traces of blood on the coffee table in the living room and also on the floor. And when they searched Paul's car, they found blood in there too. It was in the boot or the trunk of the vehicle and this of course suggested that after killing Natalie he put her body in the boot of his car. All of this evidence strongly indicated that Natalie was unfortunately dead. Paul had killed her that night and so he was charged. He was charged with murder on the 6th of May 2016 just days after he was arrested. But the case was obviously far from over. The police still had to find Natalie's body. Paul was still denied everything. He was sticking to his original story that Natalie had just left of her own accord that evening and that the last time he saw her she was alive. So he clearly wasn't planning to give up the location of her remains anytime soon. So the search for her continued and the police knew that this search was going to be 
very, very difficult because basically, let's go back to the AMPR cameras for a second. On the night that the police believe Natalie was murdered, as I said earlier, Paul's vehicle was spotted on AMPR cameras. It was picked up by a camera about 10 miles away from his home in an area called Whitchurch, which is located on the outskirts of Aylesbury. And this was around 10.15pm. And then almost two hours later at 12.06am, it was caught on a camera coming back into Aylesbury. So I believe this was when he was headed home. But unfortunately, the car wasn't captured on any other cameras in that gap of time. In that nearly two hour gap, the police had no idea where the car was. Paul managed to avoid other AMPR cameras. So I believe he cleverly avoided main roads. He drove along quieter roads where there probably wouldn't have been any cameras. So they didn't know where he had been in those two hours and of course in two hours he could have he could have gotten quite far. He could have travelled anywhere to ditch Natalie's body. So this made it so hard for the police to narrow down where she could have been. The search parameters were massive. So because they had such a large area to search, three separate police forces were drafted in to assist. Officers were sent to so many different locations every single day to try and find any trace of her. However, weeks passed and there was still no sign of her. They didn't find anything and I think as time went on the police really started to fear that they were just never going to find Natalie. They were going to have to try and convict Paul of murder without having found the body of his murder victim and of course cases like that are always so much more difficult to prosecute. But then about three weeks after Natalie was last seen alive on the 22nd of May 2016 the police finally received the call that they had been waiting for, a call alerting them that a body had been found. The body was found about 30 miles away in an area called Chandler's Cross in Hertfordshire. That day, a farmer was on one of those um, sit-on lawn mowers. He was mowing his field, and when he got to the edge of the field, close to the road, he just suddenly smelt something, this really, really awful smell. So he got off of his lawn mower, and he started started looking around, looking around in this hedgerow, around some undergrowth, and that was when he spotted a dead human body. So he immediately called the police who went straight to the scene. The body was found naked, lying face down in the undergrowth, and I think instantly the police were pretty confident that this body was Natalie. I believe the remains were pretty decomposed when they were found so they couldn't be certain just from looking at her. They would have to carry out some tests first but they were fairly sure that it was her and so they informed her family that a body had been discovered and that they believed that it was Natalie and eventually this was confirmed through DNA. The body found by the farmer was indeed 31 year old Natalie Hemming. As I mentioned Natalie's body was found naked and it's been theorised that Paul did this. He left her nudes so that she couldn't be identified through clothing or anything. The police were eventually able to determine that Natalie had been there since she went missing and was murdered three weeks prior. It wasn't like initially Paul put her somewhere else and then he later moved her body. I mean he was arrested just a couple of days after she was last seen. So Natalie had been in that spot since she disappeared. After her remains were found, she was taken to the coroner so that an autopsy could be performed. And in her autopsy, it was determined that she had injuries to both her head and her arm. She had a fracture to the right temple and she also had a broken bone in one of her arms. So the police believe that she died as a result of being hit in the head and she sustained the injury to her arm when she was trying to protect herself and defend herself. It's believed that when she was being hit in the head, she raised her arm and tried to shield her head and that's when the bone in her arm broke. I did read on one source that due to how decomposed her body was, the pathologist couldn't be 100% certain that that was her cause of death, but the injuries that she had do suggest that that is how she died.
died. Now, by this point, by the time Natalie's body had been found, of course, Paul had already been charged with murder. And because Paul had always maintained his innocence, they were expecting this case to go to trial. And at the beginning of his trial in October of 2016, he actually pleaded guilty. Well, Paul finally admitted that his original story was a lie. He finally admitted that, yes, he was responsible for Natalie's death, but he claimed that it wasn't murder. He said that it was an accident and therefore he decided to plead guilty to manslaughter. Paul's new story was that that night, the night that she died, he and Natalie were arguing and he grabbed a Fabergé egg, which is like an object, like a bit of home decor. They're pretty heavy. Paul said that he picked up this heavy Fabergé egg, which I think they just had in their living room, and he threw it at Natalie during an argument. And he said that he didn't mean to hurt her with it. He didn't mean to cause serious harm. Not sure what his intention was then. If he didn't intend to hurt her, why throw it at her in the first place? But he threw it at Natalie, it hit her in the head, and I believe he said that following this, she fell over and she died. And he said that when he realised that she was dead, he just panicked. And in this state of panic, he put her body in his car and he drove 30 miles away to that area in Hertfordshire and he just dumped her body there. However, the police, of course, did not believe that this was a case of manslaughter. They believed that this was a cold-blooded, premeditated murder. And it's believed that his motive for doing it was jealousy. It's theorised that on the night that Natalie was killed, Paul started an argument with her because if you recall from earlier on in the video, when Natalie went out the previous night with that guy from her work, Simon, her youngest child wouldn't settle at her mum Margaret's house. So Paul went to collect her. And when he arrived, he noticed that Natalie's car was still parked on the street and that she had been picked up by whoever she had gone out with. And it's believed that it was then when he realised that Natalie had gone out on a date that night. She told people that she had just gone out with friends, but Paul realised that that was a lie and he was furious. Even though he and Natalie had separated, he was so angry that she had moved on. He was jealous and he decided that if he couldn't have Natalie, then no one could. So it's believed that he probably confronted Natalie that night about the fact that she had started seeing someone else. They started arguing and during the argument, he turned violent as he often did and he began beating her. He beat the mother of his children to death. He hit her in the head so hard that he fractured her temple and she died. And then he immediately began trying to cover up the crime. He started cleaning the living room where the attack happened. That was when his son came downstairs after hearing the loud bang and he saw his mummy wrapped up in a blanket. As I said earlier, it is believed that she was probably dead by that point, which is just awful, the fact that her son saw that. Anyway, Paul cleaned up, he removed this big rug that they had in the lounge and he took it to be cleaned. I'm guessing it must have had some blood on it. He put Natalie's body in the boot of his car and then he left the house. He left the kids in the house on their own just in the middle of the night. Well, he left around 10 p.m. And then we obviously know that he drove 30 miles away and he left her naked body in that hedgerow where she was found three weeks later. The evidence that the police had collected in this case all indicated that this was a murder. This was no accident. This wasn't manslaughter. This was murder. Paul Hemming was a vile man who had been abusing his partner for years and years until he eventually killed her in 2016. So when he tried to plead guilty to manslaughter, the police just rejected it and they continued with the murder prosecution. During the trial at Luton Crown Court, all of the evidence that the police had gathered was presented to the jury. The prosecution's theorised version of events was presented to the jury. The defence obviously stuck to Paul's story that this was an accident, but ultimately at the end 
end of the trial, in November of 2016, the jury agreed with the prosecution and they found Paul Hemming guilty of the murder of Natalie. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 20 years and when he was convicted, the judge, Judge Richard Foster, turned to Paul and he said, quote, Natalie Hemming knew you were overbearing, controlling, jealous and on occasions violent. You said you would mend your ways but you did not. The manner in which you have conducted yourself since the murder indicates a complete lack of remorse. And what's truly, truly sickening is that when he was actually found guilty, Paul Hemming looked at Natalie's family who were in the courtroom. He turned and he looked at her mum Margaret and her sisters and he mouthed, quote, I loved every minute. And that just makes me feel so sick. This man had already taken so much away from this family. He'd taken Natalie away from them. He'd taken his children's mother away from them. But that wasn't enough for him. He had to rub it in. That's how vile and twisted this man was. And I'm glad that he is going to be in prison for a very long time. Let's hope that even when he comes up for parole, he is denied release because he is such a dangerous individual. Following Natalie's death, her three children began living with her older sisters. Her sister Joanne now looks after Natalie's two daughters and her other sister Kerry looks after Natalie's son. And her sisters did say in a documentary that I watched about this case that the children are doing well, they're settled, which is really, really lovely to hear. Those children honestly deserve of the world after what they've been through, losing their mum in such a horrific way and knowing that the person who was responsible was their dad. I can't even begin to comprehend how painful that must be. But yeah, they are settled, they're happy with their aunties and I'm sure that that is what Natalie would have wanted. She would have wanted her big sisters to take care of her children. After Natalie's murder, it was decided that there would be a domestic homicide review into her case and this review concluded that opportunities had been missed by professionals when it came to better protecting Natalie from the abuse that she was suffering at the hands of Paul. Because I touched on this earlier, but Natalie did report the abuse to the police in the years leading up to her murder. I believe she reported him three times in total during their nine-year relationship. It was also found that in 2013, Natalie was in touch with an independent domestic violence advisor after one incident when Paul was physically abusive towards her. And during this incident, he actually said to her, I just want to kill you. But according to a BBC News article, the domestic violence advisor passed Natalie's case over after she wasn't really engaging with the advisor as much, and so her case was passed over to the TAS, the Targeted Advice Service. And as stated on the article, quote, the TAS appeared to completely disregard the history provided by the IDVA. This information showed a pattern of escalating behaviour it was evidence that the perpetrator was physically abusive, financially controlling and emotionally controlling, the report said. The TAS appeared to minimise the abuse that she, Natalie, was suffering by suggesting that she should simply talk to the perpetrator when he was calm. Inevitably, such an inappropriate response may have made her more hesitant to report domestic abuse on future occasions or even minimise the abuse herself. The review concluded did that when Natalie no longer really engaged with the advisors about her situation, the professionals should have pushed more. They shouldn't have just accepted this so easily. It seems as though they almost just kind of gave up on Natalie. And if they hadn't, if they were more persistent, who knows, maybe Natalie would have felt as though she had the support from agencies to enable her to get away from Paul earlier, to leave him safely without having to fear for her life, fear what he might do if she did try to leave him. Natalie's sister Joanne is actually now an ambassador for an organisation called Advocacy After Fatal Domestic Abuse or AFTER and they work with a lot of families providing them with support if they have to go through a loved one's domestic homicide review just like what Natalie's family had to go 
go through in the aftermath of this case. I will leave their website linked down below if you would like to learn more about them and if you would like to donate to the organisation. But Joanne has done a lot of work and still continues to do a lot of work surrounding raising more awareness of domestic abuse. She attends conferences all over the country and she's trying to educate people on what domestic abuse actually is, the potential warning signs, because Joanne herself even says that when her sister Natalie was going through it, she didn't necessarily see it. She didn't fully understand her sister's situation because she didn't have the full understanding of what domestic abuse can look like in its various forms. And now that she is a lot better educated on that, she's trying to share her knowledge with as many people as possible so that hopefully others can identify if someone they know might be going through it. I also just want to mention Natalie's daughter, her eldest daughter. Her name is Kirsty, and she was 12 years old at the time that this case happened in 2016. She has since spoken out publicly about her mum's murder and the abuse that her mum suffered the abuse that she witnessed in the home and also the abuse that she and her siblings suffered at the hands of Paul Hemming. Paul didn't just abuse Natalie, he was awful to the kids as well. Kirsty has described how quickly her stepfather would just lose it and get really angry. She said that if they ever did something wrong, he used to punish her and the other kids by making them stand in the naughty corner in the house for hours on end. On one occasion, Paul found an old apple in Kirsty's school bag, which she hadn't eaten and it was soft and a bit mouldy, so it had obviously been in there for some Sometimes she just forgot to take it out and Paul punished her for this, punished her for this innocent mistake by making her scrub out her school bag and then she was made to stand, not sit, stand in the naughty corner for 13 hours hours overnight as well. Kirsty says that she was stood there from six o'clock at night to seven the next morning and Paul would keep coming out of his room throughout the night to check that she was still standing. Honestly it just sickens me and here is another example of where an opportunity was missed by authorities to help this poor family. Basically one day at school Kirsty plucked up the courage to tell one of her teachers that her daddy wasn't being very very nice at home. He wasn't being nice to mummy or the kids and this teacher passed on this information to the head teacher who then got in contact with social services and social services contacted Natalie to ask her about this, ask her about how things were at home and Natalie said that everything was fine and so they just dropped it. They closed the file that same day. They didn't even consider the possibility that Natalie might have been lying because maybe she was a victim of domestic abuse and she was too scared to tell the truth. Really, really, really disappointing that that wasn't taken any further. But going back to Kirsty, she is obviously a teenager now and she, just like her aunt, is doing so, so much work to try and help domestic abuse victims. Specifically, she is determined to help children and other youngsters who may be experiencing domestic abuse abuse or witnessing domestic abuse in the home just like she and her siblings had done for years. She's actually a patron of Operation Encompass which is an organisation that provides support to children who are suffering from abuse and again I will leave their website linked in the description box. Kirsty seems like such an incredible young woman, so incredibly inspiring how she's working so hard to to help other children who are going through what she went through. It really is life-changing work. But that is it for this case. That is the case of Natalie Hemming, a really, really heartbreaking case. Cases like this are always so hard to cover and I'm sure so hard for you guys to listen to. But equally, they are so, so important to talk about and spread awareness about. I will be leaving some domestic abuse helplines in the description box of this video if anyone needs them. I really hope that you don't but if you do they are there. As always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments. I would love to hear what you guys think. Also let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Again you can let me know in the comments or alternatively I do have a 
case request form linked in the description box. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye.